Uh, I'm Mazarin Banaji. Um, I'm uh, an experimental psychologist. Uh, I, I teach at Harvard University. Um, I've been fascinated by uh, two things. We call them attitudes and we call them beliefs. These are thoughts and feelings that are in our minds. We can't see them, we can't touch them. So how to go about measuring them is the interesting question. And for more than 100 years, uh, psychologists have been at this task of trying to understand, trying to get out of people what their thoughts and feelings are. Uh, these particular thoughts and feelings that I'm interested in are attitudes and beliefs that we hold about social groups. Okay? And how we use those beliefs that we have about the group as a whole you know, the, the Swiss are like this, or the Germans are like that. How do we use those beliefs in then our judgments about individual people who happen to be members of the group, okay? So that's the interesting question. And as I said, for over 100 years, people have been measuring them in the form of attitudes or prejudices that we might hold, um, uh, 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 thoughts or beliefs or stereotypes that we may have about different groups of people. How to go about doing this is the question. And we know one easy way to do it, and that is to ask people, what do you think about X? How likely is it that people from this group will be able to do something of this kind or that kind? Uh, what is their inner nature? Uh, are they competitive? Are they collaborative? Are they smart? Are they not very smart? Are they trustworthy? Are they not trustworthy? Things like that. And so we would just ask. But then asking has some problems, right? There are two problems with asking people. First of all, if you ask me what I think about X, I may not want to tell you about that because that's a private belief and I don't want to share it with you. But there is a second problem with asking and that is the one I'm most interested in. And that is that we may not know our own minds. You see, our brains do a lot of work silently, quietly. We don't have access to all of it. And we don't necessarily have access to the contents of our mind. We don't know, this may seem strange to you, but we don't know what our actual attitudes might be or what our thoughts and beliefs are. So as scientists, our job is to try to figure out in direct ways into people's minds to draw out what might actually exist there that even they may not know. So. The work that um, I have been uh, doing for the last, you know, close to 40 years now is, is work on trying to get at the implicit or the unconscious or the less visible, even to ourselves, contents of our minds. Um, we've developed tests, tests like the IAT or the Implicit Association Test, uh, which we use to bypass to get away from asking people what they might think or feel, and instead just trying to see what might be in their minds. So we might look, for example, uh, at how rapidly or how quickly or how accurately you can put two things together. Uh, and the test will reveal, in a sense, what it is that might be sitting in your mind that you may not know about. So I'll give you an example just with me. Uh, I am a woman. Uh, I have worked uh, outside the home uh, all my life. And yet, when I take a test that requires me to associate female with career and male with home, I can't seem to do that as well as if you gave me the opposite. If you ask me to associate female with home and male with career, that turns out to be relatively easy for my brain to do. Why? I don't have this belief that women don't belong in the workplace or anything like that. And yet, my brain contains the thumbprint of the culture in which I live. And that culture has repeatedly associated female and home more so than male and home. And that's now in my head. That's the important discovery that we can say consciously, we can say explicitly what we think and feel. That's one way in which our minds work. But there is another part of our mind where these associations that are picked up, sucked out of the culture and sit there, they're there all the time. Where do they come from? One of the things that we've been very interested in is looking at young children. How do young children come to have the beliefs and attitudes that they do? Do they learn it slowly as they grow up and so on? And our data suggests no, 
that children are very open to what's going on in their culture. And at a very early age, you know, at, at ages like two and three, we can see evidence that they have in their minds attitudes and stereotypes of the sort we see in adults. Uh, so what we now know is that these are picked up quick, pretty quickly and that they exist in the minds of children even at that age. But they're not always visible, uh, but we can see them in things like conversations. So a student of mine, uh, Tessa Charlesworth, has recently been analyzing data from parents and children. These are conversations that parents and children have, been, have had, and there are thousands of such conversations. And we can use uh, um, an approach called natural language uh, processing. We can use uh, machine learning to look at whether in the language that parents are using, they actually are relying on these stereotypes that they have no clue that they are. When you ask parents, they'll tell you, I don't know where my child picked this up from because I certainly don't teach it to them. And yet when we analyze these conversations that parents and children have had, we can see in those conversations evidence that parents are indeed associating, for example, female uh, more with home things and male more with uh, career things. <laughs>